bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the August 1st, 2023 podcast. This is the second part of a special two-part podcast series about the overall community development tax credit equity market. I'd encourage you to listen to part one, which was last week, but that is not required to understand what we'll be discussing today. Last week, we focused on both the micro level, that is project level equity pricing, and the macro level, the overall supply of various community development tax credits. Today, we'll talk about the demand by investors for community development tax credits. Now, when I say community development tax credit equity market, I mean the combined equity market for green energy credits, law housing tax credits, new market tax credits, and historic tax credits. I wrote a column about the various factors that come into play for all those credits and how they interact with each other for the June issue of the Novogratz Journal of Tax Credits. I'll share a link to that column in today's show notes. If you're a developer, syndicate, or investor, or any other stakeholder in any of these areas, this podcast series will give you a better overall picture of the factors to help determine the equity price per credit for various community development tax incentives. Last week, as I said earlier, we discussed the supply side of the equity market. My guests shared information about the size of the equity market for various credits, and how that supply of credits could increase if various legislation passes to expand and enhance the existing incentives as well as create new ones. In terms of creating new ones, we discussed new incentives such as neighborhood homes tax credit and middle income housing tax credit that could be enacted this year. This week, we're switching from supply to demand. We'll talk about investor income tax liability, which is perhaps the single most important factor in determining demand, along with the general state of the economy and how my guests see these trending and the impacts they're having on the investor equity markets. We'll also talk about other factors that have the potential to notably influence demand. By that, I mean such things as a proposed global minimum tax, upcoming Community Reinvestment Act regulation changes, as well as environmental, social, and governmental, or ESG motivations for investment. This discussion is intricate, as there are many factors, which is why I'm pleased to have all three guests back from last week. They're experts, and they can provide great insight. They're partners in Overgradic, of course, and they are Dirk Wallace from our office in Dover, Ohio, Tony Grapone from our office in Andover, Massachusetts, and Brad Elphick from our office in the metro Atlanta area. Dirk heads up both our local and capital working group and a working group for the proposed neighborhood homes tax credit. He works in affordable housing, historic tax credit, and opportunity zone spaces. His clients include developers, investors, syndicators, and other stakeholders. Tony helps lead our renewable energy tax credit working group and is one of the highest profile members of Novogratz's clean energy team. Tony also works in affordable housing, historic preservation, and community development spheres with a variety of clients. Turning to Brad, he leads both our New Markets Tax Credit Working Group and our GAP Working Group. It's generally accepted accounting principles working group. He also works with historic credits and local housing tax credits for a variety of clients. His main focus, though, is New Markets Tax Credits, working with community development entities, qualified local community businesses, and other stakeholders. With three guests and several community development tax incentives, there's a lot to cover today. So if you're ready, let's get started. Dirk, Tony, and Brad, welcome back to Tax Credit Tuesday. Thanks for having us back, Mike. So one of the most significant issues in federal tax credit demand is federal income tax liability, meaning the more taxes a potential investor owes, the more likely they are to consider tax credits as an investment. Now, if we look back to the 2008-2009 Great Recession, we saw equity pricing plummet as investors saw a drop in taxable income and tax liability, and many companies focused on mere financial survival and investing in tax credits was not high on their list. Later in 2017, we saw equity pricing for many tax credits drop in anticipation of the ultimately enacted lowering of the corporate tax rate from 35% to 31%. This draw reduced the value of tax losses to investors. The extent to which various tax credits were affected by the drop in the corporate tax rate was a function of the reports of tax losses to tax credits and the extent of any basis reduction for tax credits. For example, new markets tax credits weren't affected very much 
due to the fact that the new market saturated investments generally don't generate large tax losses. We talked about last week and the tax credit does reduce investors basis such that their capital account goes negative. And upon sale of their interest, the investor generally will recognize gain approximately equal to the negative capital account. As tax accountants, we all know it doesn't work quite that way, but that's common parlance to frame it that way. That makes the new market tax credit essentially a taxable credit. So when tax rates are lowered, the tax on the gain recognizes less than would otherwise have been. Conversely, as many of us know, or all of us on this call know, and many of the listeners know, locally tax credit investments generally have a higher tax loss to tax credit ratio, and there is no basis adjustment for the tax credits. As such, a lower corporate tax rate dramatically lowered the value of the tax losses and thus lowered equity pricing by about 10 plus percent. Before it was enacted, we predicted it and wanted to be wrong, but unfortunately we weren't and the pricing was down that amount and that has stabilized and there's that delta based upon the lower corporate tax rate. However, tax liability isn't the only main factor for demand. Another factor is the state of the economy. So I'm interested, Tony, Dirk, and Brad, your thoughts on how the current state of the economy uh, is affecting demand for investments in tax credits. Uh, you know, when I think about the economy, I think of both the potential for a recession as well as inflation. And with higher inflation, obviously transactions are harder to get to pencil out because of the higher costs and higher interest rates, meaning less debt borrowing all the rest, plus investors wanting higher yields uh, to accommodate uh, a higher inflation rate. With all that as background, I'll start with you, Dirk, and if you could maybe share your thoughts on how the current state of the economy uh, is affecting investor demand for loan building tax credit investments. Sure. So yeah, on our last uh, podcast, we touched a little bit on who the investors are. And when you look at tax liability, and it's the tax liability of, of those investors that I think we're really concerned with. Um, and you kind of ask yourself, well, are they oil and gas companies? Are they insurance companies? Are they, you know, you know the financial companies? And, um, and when you really look at it, you know, the, the big light tech investors are your banks and financial institutions, as well as the GSEs, which are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So when looking at that group and looking at the overall economy, um, that group is still generating quite a bit of taxable income. <laughs> Banks are doing pretty well nowadays. Um, so, uh, you know, one one thing with interest rates going up, um, banks are collecting, you know, more interest. Um, and you kind of look at that and say, okay, well, we have we have banks that are investing, banks with tax liability. You know, sh will banks continue to invest in loan income tax credits? And, you know, when, when looking at that demand, you also have to look at, well, are there other investors that they would invest in besides loan closing tax credits? And I think that's where, um, you know, rising interest rates, I think, also come into play in, in this economy and say, you know, could they invest somewhere else um, rather than investing in loan tax credits to get a similar return? And, you know, we're going to talk about other factors that impact banks later. But, um, you know, so far, you know, I mean, uh, the uh, market has still been strong. Banks are still investing. Uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they're um, authorized to now invest $850 million each. Um, that's up from $500 million each. So that's $1.7 billion that uh, can come from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So that's a you know, significant investor in the loan pricing tax credit market. So it's still a strong market out there for, for, for investors. Thank you for that, Dirk. So Brad, let's now turn to new market tax credits. Maybe just talk about new market tax credits and historic tax credits uh, and how you're seeing the economy, say the economy affecting investor demand in those two areas. Yeah, I, I think it's been interesting because, you know, we've been hearing a lot about what the economy could become in, in, in the near future. And as we keep going into the future, yeah. it doesn't, hasn't really materialized into uh, a, a recession yet, a big recession. Uh, like we experienced in 2007, 2008. Um, so it's, it's, which has been a welcome, I think, uh, outcome for, for most. And when I think about what does that do for demand, I go and listen to what the actual investors are saying publicly. And uh, as Dirk said, uh, a lot of the investors are, I think, pretty bullish right now uh, in, in terms of investing in tax credits. And I think that that's, uh, has a lot to do with what they're 
projecting their current tax liability is, but also what the next couple of years tax liability is. I think that something that will be interesting to look at, and we've seen this in, in other areas, for example, when the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act was being discussed and lowering the corporate tax rate, it started having an impact on pricing and demand before it actually fully was enacted uh, as investors were preparing for it. And I and a lot of those uh, uh, provisions uh, expire at the end of 2025, and there will be uh, likely a large tax package uh, at, at that time. And so it will be interesting to see what impact that may have on investor appetite. But I think that that's an, you know enough time down the road that it hasn't had an immediate yeah. impact uh, yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and as investors are trying to figure out what, what uh, that may become. Uh, for new market tax credits too, there's been this discussion of that there's a remaining $15 billion of allocation after uh, the current round is awarded. And there's been discussion about getting it back on track and uh, possibly having a double round to help do that. And so that would be, a double round would be $10 billion, two $5 billion rounds combined into one. And I think that that's a good uh, litmus test of, of investor appetite um, because generally I think investors have been supportive of, of that double round or an increased uh, combination of rounds. Uh, and I think that if there was concern about their appetite, uh, that uh, that you wouldn't see the support for for that. So in new market tax credits, I, I think the demand has remained relatively strong. And I think most investors at our conferences have projected uh, greater investments this year than the prior year. Now, uh, historics is a little bit different. Um, it, it, I think that uh, the, those transactions are more impacted by a higher interest rate environment, um, similar to, to LIHTC. Um, and so we've actually seen some drop off in activity this year compared to last year. And a lot of that has to do with the gap. Uh, it's, being far, it's harder to fill within in this current interest rate environment. Uh, also, property values are, are not coming down, so that, that's uh, impacting it as well. So uh, because historic tax credits are generated by the projects that are, are built, uh, if less projects are, are being built, uh, there's less uh, tax credits to invest in ultimately. And so I think, uh, as Dirk mentioned, investors essentially have a menu of tax credits to pick from. Uh, and so I think it, in, in these types of uh, environments where there's a lot of tax credits, but there's also a lot of demand. You'll, you'll, you may see investors picking and choosing certain ones over others for, uh, you know, lower, lower hanging fruit, for example. Um, and so I think that for historic tax credits, if the historic tax credit the extension or the, the HTC Go bill is passed, I think it could generate some more demand uh, for the historic tax credit. But overall, I think uh, we may see it. A slight decline or, or same as last year in 2023. Thank you for that, Brad. And as you guys know, I wrote an article a number of months back or a monthly column on the impact of higher inflation on long really tax credit transactions, particularly talking about how it affects the uh, source side, how it affects the use side, how it affects operating income and how it affects operating expenses. And News flash, not net positive. <laughs> uh, 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 and I'll include a link to that article uh, in the show notes because it's a lot, a lot of that also applies to store credits and new markets and renewables and the rest. Uh, at least from a conceptual perspective, since it's really a pro it's really an article about project finance. Uh, uh, but I also wanted to, before we get to Tony and green energy, get your thoughts, Dirk uh, and or Brad, if you have something you wanted to add to the fear that not too recently was going through the investor community, particularly in the affordable housing area with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and a number of other you know, notable investors in tax credits, certainly in terms of the volume amount that they did, it wasn't you know, that you know, notable, uh, but obviously the question was, you know, what uh, effects was that gonna have sort of longer term with the collapse of those banks? Obviously, if you're a listener to this and you had a construction loan with Silicon Valley Bank or Silicon Valley Bank was one of the equity investors that fund, it was your equity investor, 
Uh, you had deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. It was a very, very tough time for a week or two as you're waiting to see how it was all going to play out. And for the most part, it's uh, played out, you know, in a, a satisfactory way, I think, for most at the transaction level. But in terms of sort of longer term effects, when I look at the market now, it seems like it was weathered pretty well. And there aren't too many real enduring effects. I was wondering, Dirk and Brad, if you had any thoughts on that in terms of the new markets, historic or Lytic area, in terms of the effects of the collapse of a number of uh, large but smaller, relatively, uh, financial institutions. Yeah, you know, I think on the on the Lytic market, it you know it really showed the resiliency of the market. Um, Silicon Valley Bank was. A, an investor in multi funds as well as single investor funds. So, so you had um, you know a multi investor fund. Or for those of you who may not know, is is what it sounds like. It has more than one investor. So you may have six, seven, eight, nine, ten investors in there, and Silicon Valley Bank being one of them. Um, you know, other investors uh, we were hearing were willing to kind of step up and say, okay, we'll take you know that share um, that, that they were you know to provide the property in the multi investor funds. Um, sounded like they were going to be okay. Um, on the single investor side, it was just Silicon Valley Bank. But as we talked about before, one of the impacts on pricing is how soon your equity goes into the transaction. Well, if Silicon Valley Bank had put in 60, 70, 80% of their equity, but only received 10% of their benefit, well, that's pretty attractive for another investor to come in and say, hey, I'll, I'll put in that remaining equity and get twice as much benefit. So um, when, when we, you know the syndicators were really kind of looking at um, of how we could solve this problem. Um, while they were a big investor, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem like it would be that big of an issue for other investors to to, to come in and fill that void. Great yeah. thing, Dirk. Brad? I think for new markets, there was very little, if any, impact. Uh, you know, neither bank uh, were really involved in investing in new market tax credits. So I think that, as you said, Mike, it was kind of, a week or so that everyone was wondering if the, if the, these were dominoes falling or if they were one-offs. And I think, uh, once, once the, uh, investor community got comfortable that these were more one-offs than, you know, the start of the uh, dominoes falling, I think, you know, it, it became, uh, you know, pretty quickly went in the rearview mirror and things went back to, to, you know, regular programming when it comes to new markets. And I'd say the same to some degree for historics as well, but I would, I would guess that new markets was probably impacted the least. And Tony, anything you want to add before I get a more focused question for you? Yeah, no, similar because uh, Silicon Valley Bank participated in renewable energy in a similar kind of fashion that they did in uh, affordable housing. So we didn't see any major disruptions in the marketplace as a result. Um, probably a little bit more worry and some short-term panic there. I think people are feeling like the dust has more or less settled. So... Hopefully that's the case. Thank you for that, Tony. Now, last week we talked about the significant potential increase in the dollar volume of green credits. Now, Dirk and Brad have talked about the general state of the economy and the impact that has in light tech investing and new markets and historic investing. Uh, when I think about that for renewables or clean energy credits, uh, I think about you know all those same issues. Plus, as we touched upon last week. There's transferability, and that really isn't, as we talked about last week, isn't really available yet. <laughs> but, you know, transferability is not going to reduce demand. It seems like it's it's only going to increase demand or have no effect. It's not going to have no effect because it's going to have some effect. So there's some ability of that to sort of increase demand. And then similarly, on the elective pay, you know, it it doesn't necessarily you know, increase demand or really could potentially reduce supply, which is an indirect way, I guess, of uh, increasing uh, demand, I guess, because now they're they're using their own credits, if you will. They have demand for their own credits for having to resyndicate them. When you think about the equity markets and the economy and renewables, what are some of your observations? Great. So, you know, look, the IRA allows for the transferability option, um, which basically means you don't have to be an owner of the tax credit generating property to use the credits. That is unique in the federal tax credit game, right? I'm not, you know, so as a result, the appeal for renewable energy tax credits, it's safe to say, has kind of gone through the roof. Um, 
you know, becoming a partner in a partnership takes time. If you're a potential investor, you have to go through a vetting process. There's all kinds of issues you have to sort through there, tax, accounting, et cetera, business, um, you name it. And so if you don't have to be a partner in the partnership or an owner of the property, you could just buy the credits. Well, you can imagine that that really opens up the playing field to such a wider mix of potential buyers, investors, et cetera. And so it makes sense that that the demand for renewable energy tax credits is is really going to take off um, in ways we've never seen. So, um, which I think is fantastic, right? It allows uh, corporations or taxpayers to be able to um, more efficiently manage their tax liability, while at the same time be a good corporate citizen by putting their helping to put their money into socially minded causes like clean energy projects. Now, in terms of elective pay. Um, that's that's where you're. That's really available for tax exempt nonprofit types of organizations where uh, they can now own a tax credit qualifying renewable energy facility and put the credit on their tax exempt return and essentially file the return and get a refund of that credit. Um, so that supply of credits goes up there, but really they're just going to use the money themselves. I don't really see that as having. I don't. I don't anticipate that that's going to have a huge impact on the whole demand side of things because I think those nonprofits are they generally do small deals, small facilities. And so right. I think um I think it allows I think the benefit of elective pay really allows small tax exempts to participate in clean energy, whereas previously they were shut out. <clears throat> and that's when the my similar sort of experience, you get that, you know, smaller nonprofit that may have put solar panels, you know, on a facility or something of that nature and the cost of syndicating didn't make it worthwhile. So they ended up, you know, having to come up with other ways of financing it. So it'll allow more of it or not be able to move forward because they couldn't finance it because of that gap. And this allow them to have that refundability slash elective pay that allow them to move forward. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the other more global uh, issues that affect demand uh, across investors. And the one that, you know, we've been uh, fearful of <laughs> uh, as of late in that it's one of those issues that has potential to have no effect or completely eliminate a very significant investor uh, in the tax credit market. And it was one of those where I'm certainly hopeful that it ends up having uh, no effect given the binary, potential binary nature of having a major investor choose to stop investing. And of course, I'm talking about the global minimum tax. So Brad, you're one of Novogratz's in-house experts on the global minimum tax. And thanks for all the work that you've done in this area to try to help navigate us to a place where the global minimum tax won't cause some major investors to pull out of investing and treated all the tax credits. But if you could please provide our listeners a very high level description uh, and then just share some of the conclusions you think right now in terms of how it could affect uh, demand. And I'll just caveat all of that by saying the gold minimum tax is still kind of years in the full implementation if it does get fully implemented. So whatever we're talking about here, we know can be changing rapidly. Uh, so it's only as good as the time we're recording it. But with that as background, if you could uh, share some of your thoughts uh, with our listeners. Sure. And I, I think it's important to note, as you said, it, it's a minimal tax, right? And the, and the goal so, is to ensure that these multinational corporations are paying a minimum tax rate. Uh, it's currently 15% is what, the, and the, uh, is, is what the global minimum tax is. And so... As you mentioned, there there are there are certain investors that may be impacted by this. I think it's important to know that this may not impact directly all investors. But obviously, if they're U.S. based and only U.S. based, uh, they uh, you know wouldn't be impacted by this. But for the multinational corporations and financial institutions that are, this could become a a, a real issue for them. Um, as you said, it's it's. You know, nothing is is final. Uh, nothing has been enacted to date, and there's been a lot of news lately about uh, you know certain uh, lawmakers pushing back on the U.S.'s participation in this global minimum tax. 
Uh, but it's also worth noting that whether we participate or not, there still may be an impact on these corporations. Uh, and, and so what we've been concerned with is the treatment of tax credits. Uh, as, as, as we've talked about, the, the usability of tax credits it really uh, impacts the demand for them as well. And that's why we see a lot of uh, uh, individuals not invest in certain tax credits due to certain restrictions. Well, the same would be the, the case here is that if a corporation is impacted by the global minimum tax and, and the tax credits were not essentially allowed to be carved out uh, of that calculation, uh, then there would be concern about, well, if I use tax credits and I go down below 15% and got to pay a tax to get me back up to 15%, why would I make that investment? Um, and, and that's been something that we've been concerned with for a while. And uh, it, unfortunately, it's kind of the initial guidance said it only referred to tax credits as refundable tax credits. And uh, in the you know U.S. Uh, tax structure, we use tax credits, not necessarily refundable tax credits. Uh, and so that's much more of a kind of a tax scheme in, in other parts of the world. And so there was a lot of concern of whether or not our tax credits could also be could be carved out. Um, and so there was a lot of effort uh, to in the negotiations to get some additional guidance. Uh, so there was some guidance released uh, in February that reduced some of the concern. Um, but I will say that it it did not eliminate that concern uh, of the impact that the global minimum tax may have. It looks to the accounting treatment, uh, and I think that investors would prefer there to be a specific mention of the tax credit similar to refundable tax credits uh, to, to really um, alleviate the concern that they have of the impact of, of the global minimum tax reducing the value of these tax credits. And so we continue to kind of monitor the progress. Um, you know, you know it, it's, it's a uh, exercise in hurting a lot of, of, of countries together uh, to agree to it, but there's um, you know, uh, there's been changes and turns and so forth. Uh, seems like every every month on this issue. So you know, we'll continue to uh, monitor it. But in terms of its impact now, uh, you know, I I don't think that we've seen an impact in the marketplace uh, in terms of tax equity tax equity pricing. Um, but there are definitely those who believe that they may be impacted. Looking at ensuring that there's ways to. Uh, be able to take advantage of some of the carve outs that uh, are being posed in the guidance. So thank you for that, Brad. So I appreciate the, you know, overview there. And I just generally think of it as the guidance that had the release so far basically says for most structures, you'll do the calculation of effective tax rate below, before taking account the credits, which means you'll get the benefit, uh, because you won't be taking a reduction of that in your tax liability before you do the calculation. And then earlier than recently, guides came out saying transferable green energy credits are treated equivalent for fundable credits. And we've not had time to dive through it and think of all the ramifications of that, but that was a, a good uh, ruling, if you will, or good guidance. But we'll obviously be staying very, uh, we'll be monitoring it closely uh, and fearful that there's some shoe that's going to drop <laughs> It would have an adverse effect. So I wanted to move to another issue that's been front and center, once again, particularly for law commodity tax credits and new market tax credits, and that's the Committee Reinvestment Act. Uh, we expect the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the FDIC, and the Federal Reserve to issue updated guidance for CRA regulations this year. And the law commodity tax credit and new market tax credit does provide can be reinvestment credit, not a tax credit, a credit towards their uh, obligations to reinvest in certain communities. And there's concerns about the CRA regulations being changed in a way that makes investing in new markets and look as a tax credit less attractive. I will also note that there's been efforts to uh, expand the ability to store tax credit, rural energy tax credits to qualify for community reinvestment at credit. Uh, it's not that they can't, it's just they don't sort of universally qualify. And with that as sort of background, Dirk, if you could maybe once again briefly discuss 
kind of the status of the regulations and expand on some of the concerns about uh, tax credit demand from financial institutions. Sure. And for uh, if those of you that I know too much about CRA or Community Reinvestment Act, um, you know, the last major change was back in the mid 90s. So if you kind of think about banking in the mid 90s versus banking in 2023, um, you know, there's it's a much different landscape now. So especially when you're kind of talking about, you know, banks investing where they take deposits. Um, mobile banking didn't really exist back in the, you know, 1995. So um, that kind of being one thing that they're looking at saying, where where do you need to invest? What is your geographic area? And will those geographic areas change and therefore demand in certain, what we would call a CRA, a high CRA market, which is where a lot of banks have this incentive to invest, uh, demand may decrease in those areas. Now it may increase in other areas, um, but would the you know would there be a net benefit there? And I think uh, most think that uh, you know, it would be more of a negative benefit than a positive benefit. Um, you know, there's various tests that banks go through with you know with CRA meeting that CRA requirement. Um, you know, one of them is looking at um, uh, you know lending to low-income communities or investing in low-income communities. And when you look look at that as a whole. Um, Lending, uh, if a bank lends to uh, these economic development areas, they don't have to set aside as much capital as if they were to invest in those areas. So if you look at these smaller, maybe regional banks and looking at how much capital they need to put aside to make a loan or do an investment, um, that could impact uh, their demand on making an investment versus making a loan. So we talk a lot about large banks um, being the investors, but there are a lot of regional and smaller banks too that um, you know, also invest in more regional funds or, uh, you know, more local developments. And um, you know, there's going to be impact there uh, if there is CRA reform. So as, as far as the status, um, you, know, you, know, you talk to some people, they say any day, and you talk to some people and say it'll never happen. So, um, you know, not, not sure what to, what to say about the status, but I know a lot of people are, are, are talking about it. And, you know, I, I don't think it will be uh, tomorrow, but it's definitely something that um, you know, has been proposed. You know, there is uh, a proposal out there. Um, so I think anytime something has been officially proposed and uh, that kind of creates, um, I don't know if I'm going to use the word fear, but just creates, you know, a sense of urgency to, you know, dive in and, and, and see what's in that proposal to see how that might impact uh, the industry. Thank you for that, Dirk. Uh, one that I'd heard is by snowfall. <laughs> they, they would be out. They didn't say which state. <laughs> Uh, and the other thing I would just note is that generally banks have a three-year cycle where they're evaluated based upon CRA. And if we expect that the rules coming out will kick in over that three-year period so that the impact it would have on bank investing would be based upon that sort of three-year period for the most part. Uh, obviously, that could change uh, depending on what the uh, regulations actually say. So I'll, the first thing I'll be looking at is the effective date. <laughs> Uh, when the rules come out, and I would just emphasize that there is a concern that uh, banks would make fewer equity investments and make more loans. So that's the, been the area of most of the comments from the tax for equity invested communities is to ensure that the incentives to make equity investments as opposed to loans is preserved. I did want to now turn to you, Brad, about our favorite topic at Novogratic, gap accounting. Uh, the financial standing, the fa financial accounting standards board, FASB, this year uh, released expanded guidance for the use of proportional amortization method of accounting. I say expanded guidance and that it can be flanky. It's uh, investments beyond the law for the test for eligible proportional amortization accounting. We've discussed this issue in the podcast, but if you could just briefly share where we are with respect to the guidance and what impact in the near term you expect it might have in the tax credit investing community. Sure. You know, I, this was uh, a project that we were involved in when proportional amortization was created originally. I remember. <laughs> and, and, and there was a lot of uh, effort to try to uh, make sure it was available to all tax credits, but unfortunately that didn't happen then. And next thing you know, almost 10 years go by uh, and uh, another project to expand adult tax credits was, was, uh, uh, was put on the agenda. 
And ultimately, you know, as Mike said, it was a new accounting standard update was released. Um, it expanded it. It removed the the limitation to only light tech investments, um, which is a very positive thing. Uh, however, there are some uh, additional um, hurdles that certain types of investments have to overcome to be able to use uh, work polymerization accounting uh, when when uh, uh, applying it to their to their tax credit equity investments. And so each of those in, you know, new markets, historics, and, you know, renewable energy all have different ways that these investments are structured. And so, uh, for example, for new market tax credits, a lot of those investments are consolidated and uh, the, the new guidance specifically says that if you use a consolidation method, you can't use the proportional amortization method for your tax equity investments. And so, um, New Marcus was probably the one that was going to be able to most quickly and easily use the new accounting guidance uh, until that hurdle was uh, that 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 wrench was thrown in. Um, so we haven't we we've been working with clients and, and a lot of clients have been talking about how can we change the structure of, of different types of tax uh, credit investments to be able to fall within the parameters that uh, currently exist. Uh, the Gap Working Group has also been working on kind of a separate effort to uh, potentially have FASB take up another project to examine some of the parameters that currently exist and, and changing those so that it's easier for uh, transactions as they're structured now to to be able to qualify to use a proportional amortization method. Uh, so I think that while it was a it was a big win for the tax credit industry. Um, I think it was somewhat short lived so far in terms of the impact. Um, we, I don't think we really seen the impact yet, uh, until we start seeing, uh, potential changes in structures, uh, tax credit structures, um, that qualify, but assuming that, that, you know, uh, that those things happen, that tax credit structures changed so that they qualify. I think that it will be a, a tremendous uh, impact on the demand for the tax credit. Uh, you have a lot of tax credit uh, eligible investors who look at uh, the accounting for certain tax credits, not called low income housing tax credit, and and don't like the accounting treatment that they have to use. Uh, and so they would much rather use the proportional amortization method. So if they're now able to do that, uh, I, they, I think you would see much more appetite from those types of investors. Um, so I think that there's still, still work to be done. That's why the gap working group still exists. Uh, didn't, obviously it wasn't, uh, uh, only focused on this issue, but, uh, there's still definitely some work in order for it to have kind of, I think the impact that most of the different uh, investors and the different tax credits we're hoping it would. Thank you for that, Brad. And we'll include a link to the Gap Working Group in the show notes. I encourage the listeners to get involved uh, in that effort because as you point out, there's much work still to be done. I don't know, Tony, if you had any comments on the renewables uh, community and their response to the Gap uh, change? Sure. Yep. So, uh, you know, with renewable energy investments, the way those are structured, most tax equity partners um, use the equity method of accounting, okay? But when you read through the gap rules on how those equity method investments are structured, they're required to apply what's called the hypothetical liquidation at book value accounting method to um, their equity method investment. And so hypothetical liquidation at book value or or simply referred to as HLBV is... Um, considered a very complicated area of accounting guidance in terms of how you inter read it, interpret it, and apply it. There isn't a ton of consistency in the marketplace in terms of how the guidance is interpreted and applied. And so it can be a barrier. HLBV, the accounting guidance for equity method investments for renewable energy tax equity investors can be, has been, a barrier to entry. And it has actually been a reason that some investors cite as for why they decided not to invest in it in the program. Um, so I think um, the fact that proportional amortization now, you know, is, can be considered for renewable energy investments, I think is fantastic. Um, 
but there are still barriers there, even in terms of qualifying for proportional amortization. So even though technically renewable energy investments can um, consider proportional amortization, you have to meet certain other criteria before you can just say you can use it, right? And so PTC investments just, and the biggest, the biggest criteria you have to sort of work through to qualify for proportional amortization on these renewable energy investments really boils down to the pricing on the investment, okay? And ITC investments have proven to be, you know, they're priced high enough where it makes it difficult for them to, you know, qualify for proportional amortization based on current market conditions or that, that impact pricing. Um, where we've worked with investors and syndicators to try to come up with alternative structures that work there, um, but they sort of bring some some of their other challenges as well. So, I think it's I think it's great that um, it's well it's very well received. It provides an opportunity for for investors to get out of HLBV accounting, which most investors in renewable energy really don't like. Allows them to use proportional amortization, which they perceive as much simpler and easier to implement. Um, provides much more predictable results, puts the results below the line, which most tax equity investors prefer. You know, these are tax investments after all. So to them, it just intuitively makes sense that the gap results would show up below the line. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we'll see. I think there's some still, like, like there is with new markets and some of the other programs, there's still some work to be done there with proportional amortization so that it can be used, you know, more, you know, widely by all renewable energy investors. But I'm, Somewhat confident that eventually that's where the that's where the industry is headed. And do you think the key change would be to relax the rule that you have to have a positive yield for your tax incentives alone? That would be fantastic if the, if that rule could be relaxed a bit. That would really solve a lot of problems here. I think though, investors, I think renewable energy investors, um, are more determined to sort of find workarounds in terms of how they structure the deal so that they yep. can meet the current positive yield criteria without having to wait to go back to FASB and open a new project because you know that can take time and it's uncertain. So I think they'd rather explore structure, structure alternatives. Okay. Got it. No, thank you yep. for that. And that's uh, relaxing that is uh, on the gap working groups <laughs> uh, plan uh, to work with uh, the members of the group to revisit that with FASB. So there's one final area I'd like to specifically discuss before uh, bringing this uh, second part of our two-part episode uh, to a close. And that's your overall view from each of you on the motivation of investors to invest in these various green development tax credits to achieve various environmental, you know, social governance or ESG type uh, goals uh, to engage in impact investing, uh, as well as to meet various public commitments that many large institutions have made. And maybe I'll start with you, Tony, if you can share your thoughts there and then Dirk, share your thoughts in the affordable housing area. And then Brad, you can discuss your thoughts with respect to new markets and historics. Tony? Great, yeah. So, you know, big, big public companies, they invest in these types of renewable energy projects. You know, they, being good corporate citizens is a top priority for big companies and you know they want to show that they're leaders when it comes to making an impact on environmental and social issues and so uh, they've been very focused on trying to find ways that they can invest or participate in renewable energy projects um you know renewable energy projects generate one of the attributes that a renewable energy project generates is something called re renewable energy certificates or referred to as RECs. okay and so if you if you're a company and you purchase RECs from a clean energy facility, well, that helps improve your ESG reporting. And that's an important initiative that publicly traded companies have taken on is try to really sort of ramp up and improve their ESG reporting. And so how does that play out in the market? Well, if you're a sponsor of a project or a developer of a project and you're trying to raise a tax equity investor, one of the things that you've got to help make your project more attractive to the investor is being able to also offer them RECs. And so that's been a, that's been a difference maker um, to attracting tax equity investors is where you can say to that investor, look, I know ESG reporting is really important to you. Our project also qualifies for RECs. If you come in as our tax equity partner, we'll also give you an opportunity to 
to buy the recs from the project as well. And so it's helped lift, you know, the ESG reporting needs and yeah. companies desire to sort of, you know, be, get that deeper social environmental impact going have been more attracted to some of these projects for the, uh, not just the tax equity investment piece, but also to get the recs from these projects. Oh, thank you for that, Tony. Dirk, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so you know, I think I would say 10, 15 years ago, or even just five to 10 years ago, you know, we were really only seeing funds that were just kind of focused on the credit itself and the loan housing tax credit. And every now and then we may see you know, a distressed property fund or something a little unique, but uh, the general structure and properties that were invested in, um, you know, were generally the same. Uh, we're seeing more and more types of, of funds that are looking at social impact. Um, we're looking at, uh, we have a few uh, syndicators that have minority de developer funds, and where they're bringing in some first-time developers just to get more developers into the industry. Uh, we have a lot of preservation funds. We have um, clients that uh, are looking at um, is properties where they're, they're necess not necessarily uh, requiring what they would on a typical fund. Um, and lowering some of those uh, benchmarks to you know, to put a property into a fund just because it's in a, a good location where, um, you know, the investor wants to invest socially. So, um, you know, we we didn't see that five years ago. And I think now we're we're seeing a lot more of that, a lot more different types of funds. Um, and it's definitely uh, something that investors are considering, um, you know, when they're making these investments. Thank you, Dirk. Brad, about effects for new markets or, and or historics. You know, I, I, I've seen a very direct impact on, on investors uh, in, in how they have looked at new market tax credit investments in particular. As you mentioned, there's been a lot of investors who have made these public commitments. And uh, those, a lot of those public commitments didn't say tax credit investments specifically, but they're an obvious landing place for uh, filling those commitments. And I think for some new market tax credit transactions, I've seen uh, an investor come in and say, we have this commitment that we need to make. So we're actually going to increase the pricing on this transaction by several pennies on the dollar. Uh, and merely because of the, of the desire to use that investment to meet some of their public commitments. And so obviously those transactions benefit from, from that commitment. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, We've seen a lot. We, we've seen a, a good amount of that. So some investors are more specific about these commitments. Uh, and so depending on the specificity of those commitments, we've seen different investors take different approaches. But uh, similar to CRA or, or any of these other things kind of drive investors and they can kind of take this approach where it, it checks more than one box. Uh, you know, investors are willing to pay a little bit more for the more boxes it checks. And so these types of investments often uh, you know, we'll check the ESG or the, the you know, social impact uh, investing requirements. So I think that that's, in, in that case, we see uh, an increase in pricing. And so that I've seen that more so in new markets. Okay. So thank you for that, Brad. So Dirk, Tony, and Brad, let me say again, thank you for being on the podcast the past two weeks. Uh, I think you give the podcast listeners a good big picture view as to how community development tax for equity markets work both in supply and demand, and most importantly, how that flows down to individual equity pricing at the project level. Uh, I am certain that you've given listeners many things to consider. For our listeners, if you have any questions for Dirk, Tony, or Brad, I will show their email addresses in today's show notes. And I'll also share a link to the column I wrote about this topic, along with the other matters that I'd mentioned I'd include in the course of this podcast today. I do. I will ask the three of you to stick around for our mic section, where I'll get to ask you a fun off-topic question to get your words of wisdom. Back to our listeners, be sure to tune in next week when we shift gears and talk about HUD compliance issues. My partner, Susan Wilson, will join me to talk about various regulatory agreements and other issues involved in HUD programs. That's the Department of Housing and Development Programs. Often these programs are used at local and petrol properties, so if you're a property owner, manager, investor, next week's podcast is for you. We'll discuss a number of compliance issues that listeners should be knowledgeable about. We'll discuss some common pitfalls and more importantly, how to avoid them, as well as several recommended practices. 
please be sure to tune in next week. Now we turn to the off mic section where I ask, uh, get to ask each of you questions unrelated to tax credit equity markets. Uh, since there's three of you, I'm only going to ask one question. Uh, and that one question for each of you to answer, uh, what lesson have you learned in your career that you think would be helpful for everyone to learn? And uh, I randomly chose, and you got first, Dirk. <laughs> well, I'll set the bar pretty low for the rest. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so thinking about this, um, you know, I, a, a long time ago, um, when I started my career, I think, you know, we were working on, you know, tight schedules, lots of deadlines, and you you start thinking, I just want to get this done as fast as possible. And you're thinking quantity, quantity, quantity. And you're not thinking quality over quantity. Well, I think the older you get and you start getting some gray in our beards and things like that, you definitely want the, the, the quality. You want quantity, quality, quantity, but you definitely want the quality there. So um, I would say take your time. I know we have, I know we work on you know tight schedules and lots of deadlines, but um, yeah, as a... Uh, as, as somebody with, you know, a lot of staff, a lot of interns, um, you know, we'd rather have that quality product than um, you to take a couple extra minutes and, and make sure it's done right than just to see how many you can get through in a day, so. Yeah, and if you don't get it done right, you get to do it over again. That's right. <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me of a, a painting. I remember I'm painting a room or something. I always want to just like start painting. And if I don't do all the prep work and everything else in advance, <laughs> that painting takes a lot longer. <laughs> so it's good, uh, good tip, Dirk. Uh, next, Brad, what, what would be your tip here? Yeah, so when I was thinking about this question, I thought, what would I say to one of my kids uh, as they're getting older? And I've got one that uh, just is going to be starting college here shortly. And, and uh, hopefully we'll be in the... In, in the uh, workplace soon after that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's easy for someone to look at someone who's been doing it for a long time and go, I want to be there. Why am I not there yet? And I think, you know, for, for me, patience uh, was a, a hard lesson to learn. Uh, and I can see I haven't been the best at teaching it to, to, to my children either. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, it takes time to be successful. It, you you got to do, you got to chop the wood. Uh, you have to, as Dirk said, you know, focus on the quality. Um, and I think you have to do things above and beyond what's being asked for you, right? And, and you may not always get the, the reward immediately for doing that. And uh, I think if you look at the reward is, is, is cumulative, not just immediate. You know, I think that that allows you to stick around for a lot longer and be happy in what you do. And I, I just celebrated my 24th anniversary here at Noah Braddock. So, you know, that's worked out well for me, obviously, uh, being patient with that and the rewards that I've seen. So, uh, you know, I, I would just kind of, I always tell new staff to take the long, the long uh, term picture of what you want in, in the long-term approach. And, and so that's what, that's what the, the lesson I think I've had to learn and uh, I'm still learning. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Brad. Kind of reminds me of, uh, I'm a fan of Naval Ravikant and he's gives lots of uh, great advice. And one of the bits of advice that he has is you have to, uh, you know, believe in the power of compounding and all the things that you sort of do in life and you're, example is really all about compounding by investing in yourself over those 24 years, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the power of compounding in terms of your own personal growth has been uh, quite remarkable. And that's something that at the time is like, you know, investing in that and realizing the power of compounding can be, uh, obviously mathematically, it's quite obvious, but invest in it individually can be challenging and there's lots of the diversions along the way, but let's uh, turn to you, Tony. They're, they they took away the two you were going to say, I bet you're going to tell me. <laughs> it's a good thing I had a backup, okay? <laughs> so, um, look, we're, we're living in a time of unprecedented changes and significant changes, all right? And 
you know, these de- these days you hear a lot of people kind of lament about how much change we're experiencing and, you know, throughout the world and, you know, longing for the good old days. I think what I would tell people is I would discourage people from embracing that sort of mindset and instead, you know, practice the mindset of looking at change as opportunities, okay? Because I, I have a feeling we're going to continue to see a lot of changes going forward. And I think you want to see these cha- this changing world that we're living in as providing opportunities for ways to better ourselves, okay? And so I would say one of the lessons I've learned is, um, and I think I learned it maybe from you, Mike, a little bit. I mean, you learned this lesson from a lot of people, but you've, you've kind of exemplified this yourself. And that is, you know, don't be an, don't be an old dog that can't learn new tricks, okay? <laughs> Change is going to happen. Look at the bright side of change and see the opportunities in it and embrace it because there'll be more coming. Uh, yes, indeed. And and that reminds me of uh, the book Growth Mindset. And, you know, you really need, everyone needs to have a growth mindset because, <laughs> uh, you know, change hopefully is inevitable. And growth is inevitable, not just change, but positive change and growth. So having a growth mindset is certainly key uh, in any profession in life in general. Tony, I can't help but think that this is somewhat related to the Inflation Reduction Act and all the time. <laughs> <That's not. laughs> there could be leaps at times. In terms of- <laughs> well, the Inflation Reduction Act is almost a little bit like the 86 Reform Act. And I've heard Mike talk about how the 86 Reform Act, how transformative that was for his career and how there were some old dogs that couldn't learn new tricks back in the day. And right. so it's there definitely uh, were some uh, old dogs that were choosing not to learn new tricks. Right. And right. Quite open about it. And, uh, I, I was fine with that. <laughs> you could, you could, right. You could say that growth mindset that you had back then is, uh, is, is a big part of how no for grad it came to be and what it yes, is indeed. today. So, so uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Dirk. And to our listeners, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company, LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Radio Public. You can find related links referenced in this podcast on our website at www.novaco.com slash podcast. Novogratik and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.